Welcome to episode 126 of the Clarity Compressed podcast. My name is Paul J. Daly. I will be your host. And today we're talking with the one and only insightful Chris Doe about how we're going to educate one billion creatives. We're making our way through the fog of life and clarity is understanding where we are on the map. You are here. (laughs) (laughs) Let the good times roll. This is Clarity Compressed. So, you know, I interview a ton of people and I have found very few people as insightful and measured as my guest this week is the one and only Chris Doe. If you don't know who he is, um, he is the founder and CEO of the design agency Blind, which is really an OG agency. They've done work that you've seen, everything from big brand work to an amazing animated video for Coldplay. And he did an interesting thing in his career. He started to pivot attention from client work, um, you know, in the very, again, very, very highly respected to an organization called The Future, and that's spelled F-U-T-U-R, which is really dedicated toward helping creatives do what they love for money. So it's a lot, you know, there's a lot of gig culture going out there, a lot of uh, solopreneurs, and he really just turned his attention into bringing value to those people and helping them do better, um, do better building their own business and working within the structures of big businesses, but still delivering value. And the conversation gets way, you know, it, it, it's very broad. And so we're leaving this, this, um, this whole thing in its pretty much uncut form because there's so many areas we go through and we talk about several things. Um, first of all, we talk about black flat brim hats because obviously I wear one all the time and he wears one most of the time. And uh, he's got a really interesting one. I can't wait for you to see it. And he tells a story about that, which is great. He does talk about what he's doing with his organization to make it make their way through the pandemic, which I think any business owner out there is always interested to hear. And I think we always benefit from hearing these things from one another. Um, Also, we talk about branding versus sales and a really controversial topic brought up or a controversial comment from one of my previous guests on the show, CEO of StoryBrand, New York Times bestseller, Donald Miller. We get real into like, a comment he made about how you don't need to do any brand work until you have a cert 50 million in sales. I mean, it's it's a great conversation. It's an insightful conversation that I think brings value to a broad level of people in business in general. And we kind of end up talking about in this TikTok environment where there's so much content being created, not just TikTok, but there's so much content, creative content being created nonstop. How is someone who has taken the creative arts on as a career and that take it very seriously and see their work as a representation of themselves, how is it really unhealthy? How how do they navigate emotionally, mentally when you are working for budgets and timelines and you have to put something out and you can't make it perfect? Chris Doe has all the credibility in the world to answer this question and he gives a very insightful answer. Um, We're gonna try to link up timestamps because it's a long interview that way. um, You can kind of click through and uh, go to the areas that might be of interest. I think the whole interview is worth listening to just because Chris is such a well-read, well-experienced, thoughtful person. And, you know, he's, he's a professor and he, he's just done so much. If I read his credibility list, it would go on forever, but I don't want to take up any more time. I can't wait for you. If you don't know who he is to meet Chris Doe. And if you do know who he is, I'm so excited to bring you some insights from him. Chris, thank you so much for giving us some time and giving some time to the Clarity Compressed community today. It's just a pleasure to have you here. Of course. Thanks for having me. All right. So I think we have to start off with the very obvious thing. So um, I've been saying like, oh, you're, you're my Vietnamese doppelganger. Uh, we we kind of have <laughs> the hats. If you take the hat off, we have beautifully yes. perfect heads. Um, and yes. so and so like let's start talking about uh, black flat brim hats with puff embroidery, uh, which we both have. So this yes. the hat that you're wearing right now, God is a designer hat, is kind of the quintessential hat that I first saw you wear and made a statement. Yeah. Like, what's it about? Okay, so the, there's a long story here. Okay, so I'm not a fat, flat brim hat kind of guy, but I was going to this wedding of one of my uh, students, Filipino guy, and the Filipino DJ was like super cool. He had all the the fresh clothes and the hat. I was like, here's an Asian dude rocking a f- flat brim hat, and 
I like it. So I started to wear them, but I was just wearing off the shelf stuff like Adidas or whatever other brands that I like. Mm -hmm. From a shooting perspective, I'm Southeast Asian or originally, you know, so I have oily, semi oily skin. And so under the light and when things get a little hot, I start to perspire. And you know this, <laughs> your dome can act like a giant mirror. So when people would take pictures or I'm on video and they're not exposed for me specifically, there'd just be a half of my head missing because it's a giant. Right. It's overexposed. And so, yeah. It's overexposed, you know, yeah. it, it happens all the time. So from a functionality point of view, from when I was shooting, I would wear the hat just so that the team could just have an easier time lighting. It mm -hmm. creates new problems because you have to light from underneath again. So I started to wear the hat and it became part of my signature. So if something's going to be a part of your staple look or you're part of your personal brand, you have to be a lot more intentional. Mm -hmm. So this is when I was walking around at a trade show and I saw a guy walking around with a type hat. It said literally type in Helvetica lowercase <laughs> from the type director's club. And I said, I got to get me one of those. So I was like, here, this is where you get it. And I bought one. And of course, something happens. People start seeing that and saying, where do I get that kind of hat? So now it's like, okay, I'm unofficially a spokesperson for this hat. But then this hat came along, the God is the designer. So a person uh, who I've been coaching, who's a friend of mine, he's like, can I just send you a hat? Will you wear it? I said, look, here's the thing. I don't shill for people like this. If you send it to me, if I like it, I'll wear it, but there's mm -hmm. no strings here, okay? Yep. And he's a born again Christian. His name is Angel Acevedo, so it's just like, it's crazy, okay? So he sends me a hat, I'm like, Helvetica, it has the word designer in it, justified left, how could I, I'm gonna wear the hat. Yeah. Of course, when I wear the hat, people are like, wow, love the hat. So this becomes a conversation starter. Mm -hmm. That's that's a great story. Like I totally get it. And people that watch and, you know this podcast understand like this means something. It means something. It's very it's very intentional. And uh, I'm going to send mm -hmm. you one when we're done. Oh, actually, <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so um, moving on from hats. So one of the questions yeah. I've been asking all of my guests lately is how are you both personally and professionally making it through this pandemic? So I think it's just a level of curiosity that I have and a lot of other entrepreneurs and a lot of other professionals have because we're all thrown into this situation that has put us um, really up upended pretty much all of life. So um, how's your family doing? How are you getting through? And also, uh, can you explain yeah. how your businesses are getting through? Yeah, okay. So let's talk personal first, my family. We're all here. <coughs> Excuse me. We're all here living together. It's like my two boys. Uh, they can't go to school. So we're all here inside the house. And that's the longest we've ever been inside a contained space for this period of time. Yep. I, I'm a pretty active guy. I like to hike at least once a week. And the other day I went for a walk and I'd been not doing cardio for weeks. And mm -hmm. I was like, my legs feel really I funny right now. feel you there. And I'm starting to cramp up. You know, I did like a three and a half mile walk down to the beach from where I'm at. And I was like, I was telling my wife, I think I'm going to cramp up here. <laughs> and so, yeah, there's that part. There's the cabin fever part. There's the missing uh, of going out just to change the routine. Mm -hmm. I enjoy going out to eat for lunch and, mm -hmm. and for dinner. We can't do any of that. We're trying to be very responsible here mm -hmm. not to contribute to the problem. Mm -hmm. And so the only time I ever get out is to go on a grocery run with my wife, which I never do. <laughs> but on occasion like this, I'm happy to be the driver. Let's go. <laughs> I just want to change scenery. That's it's, it. It's the new date. The other. new date night. It's the grocery right? store. It's like a 30 minute drive. Where else can we go? Uh, let's keep going. <laughs> exactly. Well, the, we right. need to go to that grocery store. Right. 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 The really far away one. <clears throat> now, when it comes to work, some things have changed and some things really haven't. Thankfully, the things that have changed is. We have this ginormous building. It's a 13,000 square foot building. It was designed to hold 50 or 60 creative people. It really was. And so we've been converting space into shooting space, meeting space, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And right now there are literally only two people at the office. Oh man. So two of my younger designers, they go to the office because where else are they gonna go? Right. And so they have a couple thousand square feet between them and they're <laughs> pretty far physically apart now. Mm -hmm. So they just go there and they hang out at the office. Otherwise, everybody else is working from home. Now, we did see a slowdown in our business in terms of people buying our products, mm -hmm. but we made some adjustments and we're right back on track. So we're almost dead even to where we were exactly this time last year. Mm -hmm. And I'm super grateful for that. Normally, I have a growth mindset, like sure. always grow, otherwise yeah. you're dying. Yeah. But in circumstances like this where companies are laying off furloughing people by the hundreds and thousands in some cases, yeah. certain businesses have declared bankruptcy, big businesses, mm -hmm. and other ones have shuttered 
and close down a bunch of their outlets Mm -hmm. permanently. It's the truth. So I'm grateful. So uh, you pretty much even with where you were year over year, uh, it stunted your growth a little bit, but but you're holding your own. Yes. When when do you so everybody everybody aside from two people um, are working remote and that obviously constitutes probably a big change straight up just for like how do we move files around right that's been a problem for us right, how do we move files around you know at the office yep. we have you know super fast FiOS and now we're really at the mercy mm-hmm. of whoever how, how did how did the shift go and all of a sudden were you a remote work company in any extent before this happened yes very good question. So it was a very easy transition for us because we had been decentralizing storage and files onto cloud. So we use Dropbox, Mm -hmm. right? It's not the fastest way to sync massive video files, Mm -hmm. but it does work and Mm -hmm. it takes a while. So for months prior to this, we had dedicated computers to just sync to the cloud. Mm -hmm. And we have fiber optic at the office. Mm -hmm. So when this hit, it was a fairly easy decision. Everybody for the foreseeable future, work from home. Mm-hmm. Only come to the office if you need to get something, be safe, mm-hmm. take care of your family, what you need. Mm-hmm. And there was that initial period of adopting to this, especially for people who weren't used to this. Yeah. But most of my my directors, they come and go. There's no set schedule. Mm-hmm. They, they do what they need to do. They're responsible people that you trust. Mm-hmm. And so I don't need to micromanage anybody. So what do you think, like, so for us, I love the team dynamic. I love people being together, especially in the creative spot, like the ideas, you never know when they're going to come up and they just happen as you're working through things. Uh, so I was like, yeah. we're not a remote work company. This happens and all of a sudden we shift to remote work um, very in a very similar sense. Like all of our stuff is synced to Dropbox from our servers here. So like we could do it. Um, and then I went through like these phases where at first I'm like, oh, actually, you know what? We're getting a lot done. Right, because meetings take up a bunch of time and a lot of stop ins take yeah. we're like, oh, this is great. We're actually getting more done. And then little by little that migrated back to like, well, now there's a lot of Zoom meetings and now we're back to the same yeah. drudgery. Um, you know, but I think like when we change and we go back, we're gonna go back to some level of hybrid. Like I don't think I have the same stigma I had before. Um, do you think you're gonna go back to some level of hybrid or do you even can you even think that far ahead? <laughs> I can't think that far ahead. And I, I don't know if the old way was the better way. It was just the default way. Sure. And I think we've had three months of adopting to a new habit and mm-hmm. we have to take assessment of what was good and what was bad. Mm-hmm. Here's some things that I've noticed. I'm getting a lot more work done these days. Personally. I really am. Personally, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think the team is too because uh, they're producing more videos than we've ever had, mm-hmm. like ready to be dropped. I, I have a surplus of videos that I need to release. Mm-hmm. So everybody's working. It's because the meetings, the the little inter-office kind of meetings that happen when people bump into each other like, hey, what's going on? Yep. So you realize that the office is a distraction factory. Mm-hmm. And I read about this in the book, uh, Remote, from mm-hmm. Jason Fried and David Heinen and Hansen. Mm-hmm. It's like, there's all these reasons why the office is killing productivity. So we expect people to work harder while giving them more distractions mm-hmm. and then managing them and having management meetings mm-hmm. is not really producing a whole lot. So what we need to do, and this is a bit of a shift for some of my younger guys especially, they need to learn, like, I'm self-directed. I, I have autonomy over the things I do. Mm-hmm. Nobody's going to be looking over my shoulder. And mm-hmm. so if if that's what you need, this is not going to work for you. Mm-hmm. It is making me really look hard into, I, I, I pay a lot of money for the space that we don't use. Mm-hmm. So what is the minimum amount of space that we need to do mm-hmm. all the things I want to do? Mm-hmm. And so we're looking at this, like this is an opportunity and, and I want to be smart about that. Do you think, um, do you think that, the human element and the human connection that happens in the business in all those, you know, uh, ad hoc bump into people at the water cooler, you know, Hey, we at the game on Friday. Has that changed the human fulfillment factor of people? You know, people like working together. So how have you seen that affect the company? Yeah, I, I think there is something to be said about that because we're all very isolated at this point. And I don't think humans uh, are meant to be isolated for a really long periods of time. Sure not. And, we are trying to figure that out as mm-hmm. we go. So we had said, you know what, you guys, maybe we need to do something where at your discretion, have like a Friday, like movie day. Yeah. The people just drive into the office once a week instead of every single week. Right. Yep. Mm-hmm. And have pizza, mm-hmm. watch a fun movie and just share the same physical space as somebody else. Mm-hmm. 
And of course you could do these zoom meetings. They're not the same. I'm not going to tell you that they're the same. Never. And we're trying to figure it out. So yeah. we want to design meaningful interaction and collaboration versus default interaction. No, I think that, I think that's really good uh, perspective. Um, and I think that'll help anyone owning a business is to, to just get in that mode of assessment, right? We romanticize yeah. or that we, do we just accepted the way things were? I need a building. I need a space for everybody. Uh, we need to do it like this, have meetings like this. And then we were forced into learning a different way. And the prudent, the prudent thing is to not romanticize the past because that's just assuming that was the better way. And we have an opportunity now to learn a better way, basically. 100%. All right. So um, thanks for sharing that. I think those insight, everyone always wants to know what everyone else is doing, right? And we take a little sure. of this, take a little of that, make it a couple notes myself, um, you know, and that's how we grow. So I want, I, I recently, I've been, been kind of listening to several of, you, of podcast of your podcasts over the last week, you know, and kind of in preparation for this interview and try to like understand like, hey, where do our worlds collide and how can we bring the most value in the conversation? And one podcast stood out specifically. It was uh, uh, one that you did. It was episode 61 back in September with Melinda and Fabian discussing a statement mm. that Donald Miller made, you know, talking about, yeah. uh, talking oh, about, see, you know, we well, here's the thing. The funny thing is like, I've been a student of Don. I was, I, from when he were, wrote his first book, Blue Lake Jazz, and I've really, you know, been a follower of him, you know, follower. I've, I'm, I, I, I'm into his work, right? His work has affected me, changed my perspective. Story brand changed my perspective and really was a part of the first framework that I ever even thought through and like, oh, how we will communicate this. I had him, I, I went down to Nashville, for, no, geez, it seems like a few weeks ago, it was actually like, a few yeah. months ago, right before the pandemic hit. And he was a guest on the podcast uh, a few weeks ago. And we didn't talk about that, but I didn't know he said that or I would have talked about that. Um, so yeah. the, the concept, basically, um, we were talking about the difference between branding and marketing. And you know, his yep. statement was a pretty, pretty shocking statement to a lot of people in the community saying like, hey, unless you're a business of 50 million, uh, 50 million in yeah. revenue or more, you shouldn't spend a penny on branding. And uh, it, I'm going to link it up below because I thought it was a very thoughtful conversation on the topic and really broadened yeah. my horizon. So can you summarize your perspective? Yeah, so, so we need a little context, right? The mm -hmm. context is that as a content creator, you sometimes have to say things that you may not want to say exactly that way, yep. except for the fact that it's going to cause a stir. You need to be a little bit, of, uh, bring a little controversy and you have to say things emphatically. Mm -hmm. You got to pick a lane. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, strange and ironic because he wrote this book story brand or brand story story right? brand. no story it's brand. Like, it's company's yeah, called story brand. story brand so right so how how can you say branding is not important and then simultaneously say marketing is more important so it, it causes a stir in people in my community that are designers who attach themselves to this idea of branding their self-identity and their self-worth mm -hmm. saying that this is not necessary so, of course, it's a great talking point. And it, it bent a lot of people out of shape. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I'm mature enough to step back and like, I think I understand what Donald is doing. <laughs> so it's totally OK. And I've read his book and yeah. I, I like what he's saying. And it's he's making something that's complicated for a lot of people really simple. And that's the genius of the design of itself. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I have two branding people, yep. Melinda and Fabian. And they wanted to have this conversation about it. So look, the perspective is this. It's like if you truly understand what branding is, if you truly understand that it's everything that you do, how can you say you don't need to be aware of the things that you do until you hit $50 million? Mm -hmm. The mom and pop shop that's a, a local coffee shop has a story to tell. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. Mm -hmm. But if you reduce branding down to what it looks like, what designers usually make, then he's probably right that you don't need to invest all this money, especially if you're a startup. Mm -hmm. You don't need to pay somebody $100,000 for a beautiful logo. Mm -hmm. You may not need that fancy website or the mm -hmm. app because you have to build a business, and that's really important. Mm -hmm. And to build a business, you need customers. Well, how will you get customers? Marketing. Right. Right? So I get Absolutely. what he's saying. And, and I get also the reaction, but it's just like we live in a culture and a time when something sets us off and we're not really willing to step back and say, what is his intention? Let's examine. Why is well, he doing this? Gosh. Yeah. If, if we had more of that in the culture today, we would have a lot less problems in the culture today. Like that's I think that's a great statement Ooh. to just overlay on our culture. We're talking about like, hey, like that's, I think, a, a really powerful statement just in and of itself. It, it applies to the design and branding world, just it applies to all of us in culture. And we won't get into that because that, that could be a very, very deep hole to go down. But so right. the 
getting people like what is the brand and the conversation kind of went that like, well, how would you define brand? One of the things that, that I define it as and we define it as congruent is like, well, brand is a feeling. It's kind of a gut feeling, mm-hmm. but it's the feeling you get when you see a logo, when you buy a product, when you open a product, when you meet a person on the team, really, like I say, you know, your brand is not your logo. The logo is an expression of your brand. And, and as we, I was listening through that conversation, it was like, yeah, because the brand, like you're building a brand, whether you know it or not, whether it's intentional or not, like the difference in the intentionality is really what separates the people that understand what they're about and understand why they connect with people. Um, because, I don't get to define what my brand is. I can only pick what I think I want people to feel when they interact with me. But when you say the word Nike or show, show a Nike swoosh, people have a whole myriad of feelings. Some people feel like I like their, I like their style. Some people think um, Colin Kaepernick. Some people think social activism. Some people think of their favorite college team. Are you a Nike team? Are you an Under Armour team? So Nike doesn't get to pick what I feel. Right. But they right. can they can produce right. things and do things that try to elicit a certain feeling. I'm a Nike fan because the just do it mentality resonates with me. Like do it, like do what you believe in, even if it like even if it does, you know, and that message is controversial. But as an entrepreneur, right, as someone who's motivated, like when I put my Nikes on, I kind of feel like I'm part of that community that like goes goes and gets it. And so what, yeah. so the thought on Donald on Donald saying that, right, he's got a brand. You know, he maybe is, is not, he's not a $50 million company yet, but he's approaching that. He shared it on the podcast, but, but they've been intentional. Um, you know, so we talked about this difference between branding and marketing and like you said, mom and pop. Well, it was the question you asked on your show. You said, if there's a hundred thousand dollars and you, you had to spend it on branding or marketing, yeah, how should you spend it? And what, what, can you summarize your answer? I remember what it was, but can you summarize it? Shoot, I, I I don't. So all right, so here, me out here I'll help you out. So basically, it was you need to split it, but very intentionally, you know. And you can't set a this set a percentage, right? Because if you have if you're a new company, right, you're not going to have a hundred thousand dollar logo. The kerning just isn't that important, right? I can't say that some people on my team, but the kerning just isn't that important, right? It's right. very important when you can spend the, the level of money in business, we're always boiled down to the amount of money, right? That's our, that's our limitation. Yeah. So, um, you know, what do you think, what do you think for the mid-sized business, like in this culture where brand is this feeling and it is, it is whether or not we, you know, we agree, you know, everyone agrees on that. When I see something, I feel that way. What do you think is the most impactful thing somebody can do to intentionally build a brand. Is it internal? Is it external? Okay. What do you do? Okay. Before I answer that, I, I want to add something to the conversation because as you were helping to recap like the discussion and the different talking points here, I kind of look at it like this. If we're going to sit here and debate whether branding or marketing is superior or one is more necessary than the other, then we've lost the fight altogether. I think they're the two sides of the same coin. One does not exist without the other. And it's to, it's futile to try to separate. It's like you can't have a one-sided coin. It right. doesn't exist. Yep. Okay. Here's what happens. All right. Say you're a company and you're like, you know what? Branding is not important to me at all. And you spend all your money on marketing. So you're running ads, you're running campaigns, retargeting, mm-hmm. radio, print, TV. You're doing everything you can to get the word out. Great. Fantastic. You have customers. They, they show up. And then they buy a car or they buy a product that you make. Uh, but when they touch that product, it doesn't seem to be in alignment with the things that you told them about. Mm -hmm. And then when they use that product, it starts to fall apart. Mm -hmm. And then when they call to complain about an issue, people hang up on them or they're rude. Mm -hmm. This is now your brand. So everything that you do prior to the moment of the customer showing up to your place, you could consider that an expression of marketing. But once they actually consider becoming a customer and start to engage with your product service or whatever organization, that's part of the brand. Let's so you don't, coin. so you don't marketing. Well, okay, so yeah. you don't think just to, to explore that a little further, you don't think that the the way in which the marketing is communicated begins to give people a feel for the brand. 
It can, but oftentimes, especially if we look historically, if you look at marketing and advertising, mm-hmm. they're telling us all these things. And most of the times it's designed to trigger something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you're working with Wyden and Kennedy at the level of Nike, mm-hmm. branding and marketing is said in the same breath and the same thought. Mm-hmm. But when we bring it down to a $10 million company, and they don't have a hundred million dollars or five hundred million dollars to spend on marketing and advertising. Mm-hmm. They might just put out a piece of marketing to get you to click, mm-hmm. to get you to show up, promotion, sale. You yeah. know, a lot of the things are driven by sales, right? Well, sales is not branding. Sales is just talking about the price or a promotion or something like that, right? Or you're giving stuff away, but you're not really being intentional about who you are, what you stand for, the look and feel, the touch, the messaging, and 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 creating an experience for the customer. And that's really, really important. So now if we take the other side, I'm all about branding, marketing, stupid. I'm going to do all the things about branding. Well, this is fantastic. So you work on your culture, your messaging, your touch points. The whole experience is well-crafted, well thought out, top to bottom, A plus. And nobody shows up. You're out of business. <laughs> what are you going to do? Out of you business. You can't brand your way to like, <laughs> you know, so you have to get customers in the door to experience the brand to begin with. hmm that's how it works. So ideally what happens is you work with a brand strategist who understands marketing as well. And sometimes mm-hmm. they're the same person. Mm-hmm. You figure out who you are, what part of your story is relevant, what problem you're trying to solve, what kind of community you're trying to build, what kind of tribe you're trying to align yourself with. Mm-hmm. And then everything from that moving forward. If you take it from this point of view, then the copy that you write to get customers in the door, the websites that you design, everything speaks the same language. Mm -hmm. I don't want to show up expecting you speak Italian and you're speaking uh, Korean. It just Mm -hmm. doesn't work that way. Yep. So it's almost so from a marketing side, if I think I'm thinking of like eBay 1.0 from a marketing standpoint, and maybe you could even argue marketing and advertising. You have a product name. You have... Um, a description in the same text on every post and you have at the time, which were pretty standard pictures, right? They were all pretty low quality pictures, right? That's, I have a product. It costs this much. You should buy it. Right. And now, but I would say that like, as eBay progressed, and I'm just using that as an example right now, like all of a sudden I have a product, here's a picture of it. Well, I could show you a picture of this pen, right? That is just shot on a, a like pixelated poor lighting. Or I could show you in a light box, right, where you could rotate around the pen. And I think that that does say yeah. something about the seller. You know, the intentionality. So I would argue that, like, the brand begins to develop right there. And you're saying, I think what I, you know what I'm saying? You're first in the marketing side. Like, if you're just saying yeah. words like car for sale, click here, right, at Bob's Ford or at Joe's Ford or raise for it, right? They all seem very vanilla. Now, when you show up, right, you're going to have a different experience at each one. So I think the branding, which maybe leads to your point about the brand strategist, right? I'm not necessarily spending $100,000 on a logo, but I am intentionally making my marketing. I'm intentionally writing the copy with a tone and a personality that I want to exude that hopefully when the customer shows up, it all matches. Yes, it needs to be in alignment because the days of a company or a brand marketing to you, telling you whatever it is that they say is true Mm -hmm. are are over because we don't believe in that. Advertising actually, and advertising, not marketing, Mm -hmm. advertising actually drives customers away. Mm -hmm. We're we're, we're super savvy these days. And what we do is, this is why the rise of influencer marketing, social media, because we'd rather buy things from people that we trust and people who can vouch or validate that this is good. Mm -hmm. Uh, because the barriers to entry are are no longer uh, there. Quality used to be a distinguishing factor. Mm -hmm. And now we expect quality from everything. So what else do you have? And you have to learn. So in your example, eBay may may or may not be the right analogy here for it to work (laughs) off of. So the seller who who just takes a low, low resolution, poorly lit pen, Versus the one who has a whole setup, like mm-hmm. a lighting setup and does a 3D rotation. Mm-hmm. To me, the difference between those two is one put more effort into it than the other. Mm-hmm. One has a higher fidelity rendering mm-hmm. of the pen. Mm-hmm. And that may communicate to you, the buyer, this is more legit. Mm-hmm. 
I still don't have a feeling. I just like you tried harder and it's more legit. Yep. And sometimes it being too legit on eBay might make me feel like this is a scam. Yeah, right. You know, it's like I right. want a real person. Yes. Right. But on the other hand, if you had a low resolution photograph that's poorly lit of a person holding the pen and it said this pen was owned by somebody who wrote this. Pen, <laughs> yes. That's a story. Yes. Yeah, You're buying now, the story, not buying the pen. Yeah, because it's a pen. I heard a great story. Day. I heard a great story on NPR. And uh, are you familiar with uh, a violin that's a Stradivarius? Okay, so the story goes like this. I know the story. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. So let me summarize it. But you should tell it. Yeah. yeah. So the, the Stradivarius is uh, kind of unequivocally renowned as the, the pinnacle of, of, of an instrument. It's, it was made by Stradivarius and, you know, the, the generations and the iterations. So they said, well, let, does it really sound better? And everyone, yes, Stradivarius sounds amazing. So they took some people who played first chair violin uh, in orchestras across the country and they gave them Stradivarius and they gave them a replica Stradivarius, except they told them that the opposite was. They gave them the replica and they said, this is the Stradivarius. And then they gave them the Stradivarius and said, this is the replica. They let them play them both and they said, what do you think sounds better? Hands down, every single one said, without a doubt, the Stradivarius sounds, or the replica, everyone said sounded better, right? And then they told them and they blew their minds. And just because they thought they were playing the story. And so they bought into the yeah. story. And I, I love that, yeah. that illustration because we do convince ourselves that something is better when we've bought into the narrative. So almost always, almost always. And the thing is, there's this objective truth and then there's our subjective interpretation, the narrative, the story that we tell ourselves. Mm -hmm. Savvy marketers and savvy branding people help us with that story. They hint at the story. Mm -hmm. So when we hold a substantial glass and we drink a, a type of whiskey or scotch in it, mm -hmm. the glass makes the scotch or whiskey taste better. That's right. The bottle that you buy the wine in with the label and the price it tells you a story that this must be good because why would people pay this much for this thing? Mm -hmm. And Seth Godin does a wonderful job about this, talking about it in his book, All Marketers Are Liars. Mm -hmm. He says these <laughs> yes. are the lies that we tell, mm -hmm. right? And then we have to, as a participant, buy into the lie. We're complicit in this. We're not being manipulated. Mm -hmm. And we tell ourselves this is good. Yeah. Uh, the same is true about bottled water and cars. Mm -hmm. What do we tell ourselves? It drives better, tastes better. I could, I could feel the, the electrolytes and yeah. it just makes me healthy. <laughs> right, so right. we're just telling ourselves stories all the time. Mm -hmm. And do you think that, do you think that brings value to our lives? Is that's why we do it? I don't think we know how to function otherwise because we are uncomfortable not knowing it's uncomfortable. So what mm -hmm. we do is we make up meaning and this is the beginning of superstitions and other narratives. So if I, I told you, Paul, you're a really superstitious guy. You might get really offended because you know, it's totally illogical. Walking underneath a ladder doesn't shorten your life. Breaking a mirror doesn't hurt your mom. We know this and picking up a four leaf clover is not going to suddenly increase your chances of doing <laughs> anything any better. We know that and we accept that yet we will bristle. If I told you most of what you believe is a story you've already told yourself. Mm -hmm. That's not really grounded in objective truth. Mm -hmm. You want to believe it. And that's a scary thought. You just want to believe it because it we, we don't like not knowing. Yeah, that's great. Well, it's, it's an element of control. It's an yeah. element of control. How many times has this happened to you? You pull into a, a busy uh, mall parking lot and the first 10 <laughs> slots are available to you. You pull into one and you're like, wow, Dude, I have just good karma. I'm a good play the lottery today. Karma. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everything is like, or could it just be that somebody just pulled out right before you got in? Yeah. Maybe that's the objective truth. It's funny that that plays its way all through every level. If you, you know, go through Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right. And you get to the top of it and it's like, yeah. oh, it's, it's, it's a higher, like understanding, like actualizing a higher purpose or a higher value or a higher being. Um, there's this element of through faith and religion it's, it's obviously humanity. Like we have a tendency towards faith, right? We need to believe that it's true. Now you and I, I have no idea what your views are. We have different views maybe. Um, but a lot of people across the country have different views and I, there's an element in humanity that is wired that way. That's our default position. And so, uh, it's an interesting thing that like that makes its way all the way down to like, I, I think these electrolytes are really giving me a boost of energy. Even the, even though I just yeah. ingested them three seconds ago. Like, oh, I'm standing a little right. taller. Put, remember the Reebok pumps? 
Remember those? I remember as a kid, I was in elementary school yeah. and the kid that had the pumps before we would play basketball, he's like, hold up guys. And you know, let's do this. I'm like, man, that kid's playing great today. And maybe he was playing better. Maybe he was because yeah. he thought he was faster. I think he was because he believed it. I agree. I agree. So, yeah. so pivoting from that, that conversation. So do you know who Scott Galloway is? The algebra of happiness. Um, no, he, I do Okay. Not. So, uh, I, I heard him on a podcast, the CMO podcast. Um, so he's, he teaches at NYU Stern School of Business. Um, and he has this book that really hit called The Algebra of Happiness. And he's, he's a pretty brilliant marketer and, and just deep thinker. So he said in the podcast that we are kind of the sun is setting on what he called the brand era. He said, so the brand era okay. was back when big businesses could turn mediocre products into amazing progress prog- products through clever branding. So think choosy moms choose GIF. Right, we've just created a brand feeling around that, and I, you know, and peanut butter that was pretty much the same as all the other brands. Now, orders of magnitude outsold it, right, because they created a brand around it. He said now um, that um, building brands around normal products for big businesses, it's lost its advantage, and now the real opportunity for big business to grow is by dominating a lane in someone's life. So think um, Amazon, think Netflix. So now that's how we get the scale is through convenience, through availability. And, you know, I heard that and I was like, it, it caused me to think for quite a while. I just went, what, what's your first reaction to that thought? Like the brand era is dead. We used to be able to brand and make progress and now it's convenience and availability. Yeah. Not knowing the full argument, I completely disagree. Mm-hmm. Uh, I could not disagree even more. So let, let's talk about that. That was right? pretty much, so that's, a sum- yeah. Yeah. that's a summary of the Okay, that's pretty much sure. it, right? Yeah. So if, that, if that's what he's saying, then I, I could not disagree more, and I'll, I'll tell you why. The era of advertising, of manipulating, of telling people what to think about things is over. It's mm-hmm. been over for a long time. We're mm-hmm. not at it. It's, it's in the past tense, in the rearview mirror. I, I just think if he just changed that word, it would have been fine. Mm-hmm. But if he's saying that the, the, the uh, emotional connection that you have with products is gone mm-hmm. and will be gone, then I think he's mistaken. That's, that's what he was saying. saying. He was saying that because he said, right. now I just want the peanut butter that's, that's fastest. I know this is similar to a conversation you had on a recent podcast where you disagree with the guy on just about everything. It was funny, but, um, but yeah, but said like, Hey, that's, <laughs> so that's, here, here that's peanut butter. I'm not a choosy mom. I don't care about being right. a choosy mom. I'm going to take Amazon's choice peanut butter. Right. So look, look at this. You know, you know, Harry's razors. Yep. Okay. So I think uh, the dollar shave club of my, my timeline is correct. Well, it happened first and that was the thing. Yep. And it's like, what is dollar shave club? It is purely a brand. You like this funny all guy who's day. doing wild, really ridiculous things. It's all it is. It's a commodity. And what happens is they get so big that they get acquired. Yep. Okay. And I, I think they got acquired by Gillette, right? Yeah, Unilever, I think, who owns Gillette. Okay, so they yeah. got right. So they, yeah. they got acquired because you know what? Because they were becoming a one threat. one billion dollars. Yeah. Right. One billion yes. for a commodity. Yeah. Something that we don't even think about. Yep. And then Harry's is also kind of like happening on a similar timeline. Mm-hmm. And they have this whole story. And it's like, why would I choose this thing versus that? Mm-hmm. And this is the thing about brands is this in this world that we live in, we're looking to find meaning and we actually find meaning in the things that we buy and the services that we purchase, mm-hmm. period. Mm-hmm. Like when you drive a certain brand of car, mm-hmm. you, you say to yourself, this is who I am. Mm-hmm. Like some people are Ford people, some people are Chevy people and they just don't cross. Yep. Like if you buy a nice uh, luxury European car, it's like you tell yourself a story. Mm-hmm. I'm a driver's driver. Mm-hmm. I'm a precision driver and I deserve the best and German cars are better than domestic. You tell yourself all these kinds of stories. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what they're talking about. So in this case, if he's like Amazon is dominating because they own a lane. Yep. I, I can't argue that. Like it's very hard to argue against Amazon success sure. right now. Yep. So it's like, uh, let me predict how successful they're going to be. Well, that's not really going very far. And you could literally almost attach any kind of meaning yep. to this and yep. say you're right because the evidence must be true. But let's look at Netflix. <laughs> mm-hmm. Netflix happened to be the dominant player coming out of the gate doing live streaming before everybody was live streaming. Yep. So they have first to market advantages and we have to just remember that. There are many other players and believe it or not, people in the media industry know this. Netflix is going to be in trouble. <laughs> they're going to be in trouble because when you have giants like Disney and Apple getting into the game, spending yeah. billions of dollars each year to acquire content, yep. it's become a, a crazy wild, wild west. Mm-hmm. Okay. So here's the great part. We will always probably remember the DVR as a TiVo. 
Mm-hmm. And we will probably refer to certain things as the X, Y, Z because they were first to market and they sure. occupy so much of our mind. Whether or not their business survives, we don't know, but at least you have that connection. Yep. So my, my thoughts, my thoughts following that discussion. So as a brand guy, right, I preach brand, yeah. I sell brand, I believe in brand. Um, it was, you know, it, I was taken aback by it. And then I realized that I couldn't, I couldn't disagree more. The, but the fact that the ability to spend the money and access to the talent and budgets big enough to, to actually advertise then, it was controlled by very few. And so that's, that's who could build a brand. And now I feel like it's almost like a brand renaissance because that barrier has been eliminated. And now we have, you know, even people like yourself who is training up an army of creative marketers who can now make content, who can craft stories, who can present. Now I feel like it's available to the masses. So I feel like this is a brand renaissance. This is when we can really dive in and appreciate and see all the nuance that can come and the beauty that can come through brand, like in commerce and bring art and commerce have never been more closely tied together. So that's, that was my perspective on it. 100%. I agree with you. You know, I was reading somewhere online that there's the rise of the small niche brands. These micro brands are actually crushing it and they're actually able to compete against behemoths like Amazon. Yeah. Here's another example. Dr. Squatch, hand cut soap for dudes, right? (laughs) It's like, okay, nourishing, whatever it is, all natural. (laughs) So you can actually come up with something Mm -hmm. that has a funny, unique story that is a commodity again and dominate. Uh, I think in 2017, this guy uh, who's now living in San Diego was doing something like $8 million of business selling 30 or four or five dollar bars of soap that's That's incredible to me absolutely that's a lot of soap i think think another example is is like um like a a commodity product like bombas socks so you have socks what happened the sock come this went direct to consumer they built a brand around their beliefs of you buy a pair we give a pair like you know similar to tom's but yeah. a, to- a total, com- yeah. more of a commodity than Tom's because you can't say just shoes. There's so many types of shoes. But like socks are pretty – I mean maybe there's performance socks or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> but but most people like aren't that nuanced. Like that's a sock. It's a tube sock you know, and it's black. <laughs> and so, yeah. so I, I think you're right. But they did it because they built a brand around it. So do I, I buy Bomba socks now. Why? Because I, I relate to their mission. So yeah. You feel good. All right. So – that's, that's proof right there though, right? Mm-hmm. Commodity item that's not a dominant player in a lane. We don't even know if there's a lane for socks, right? Mm-hmm. And you buy it. Why Why do you choose that over anything else? Because it says something about you, your beliefs, and your values. Absolutely. That's a story that they prepared for you and you readily sign up and say yes. Just like all these one-for-one programs. Mm-hmm. It's like it makes me feel better as a consumerist, which I don't always feel great about. Sure. In a capitalist society, mm-hmm. that I could do something that can actually help people who are less fortunate. That works perfectly. By the way, I have to educate you on your socking. We got to level up. Happy socks is where it's at. All socks right. are not all socks. There we go. So we'll talk about. That later. We'll we'll <laughs> let the brand wars begin. Yes, and we'll figure this out. Um, so uh, along the lines of that, you know, I, I, people definitely have different levels of what they care about. I think uh, when it comes to gum, when I walk into the when I walk into you know the store at the airport or whatever to buy gum, I I honestly don't. I can name some brands, but I don't lean to one. I, it's that's for me. It's, so it's not everything, you know. And people think like it's not I, everything. I'm a brand guy, so like I think deeply about my brands, right? Yeah. And a lot of people are like, I don't think about like my wife would think less about a lot more than I would about what brand. But on some things, she's very very into it. So yeah. I think that, that there's a sliding scale there. Um, let me ask you this: So you, you've never been in the automotive industry, correct? Not from that side. I've worked on big car brands before. Big, big car brands. We're talking like tier one though, right? Yeah. Like, okay. So we're talking tier three individual dealerships or small dealer groups that are now trying to get you to buy a vehicle. Do you own, are, do you own vehicles? I do. Yes. Okay. So what is your perception of the auto industry as far as brand goes on tier three? From a, from a car, like a car dealership point yes. of view? Yes. From a, yeah, like not, I'm not talking okay. Ford, Kia, whatever. I'm talking about shopping yeah. for a car at a local dealership. Horrible. My, my impression, it's horrible. And I have to tell you a personal story here. So when I was uh, just out of school, mm-hmm. I had a hand-me-down car for my older brother. It was a Nissan 200 SX or SE or something like that, it's right? It's a great hand-me-down it, car. It, it broke down. 
It broke down. It was a hatchback, flip up lights, the whole thing. <laughs> I know exactly it broke the down car. <laughs> and I had to buy a new car. So I go into a Honda dealership and I knew at some point I wanted to buy a Mercedes, but I wasn't well off enough in my business and my experience that I could afford a Mercedes. So I'm like, I just want to buy the cheapest car I can buy mm -hmm. that's reliable. So this is my in-between car. So I go to this Honda dealership and I'm like, give me the cheapest car. I just want the Honda Civic hatchback, no frills, no nothing. And the guy was a total stereotypical car salesman. Okay. And he's like, how much do you want to pay for this car? I'm like, I didn't know it began like that. Right. So he began there. He's like, do you want to buy it or lease it? I said, I only want to lease it two years. I don't drive it that much. I just need something to get me around. And he plays this game with me. The high pressure. Let me take advantage of this kid. So he's like, it's $700 a month. I'm like, for a Honda Civic? And I just did the math, right? I'm like, this is ridiculous. You can buy the car Basically, twice, and, right. Yeah, yeah, at this point, and he's like, well, what do you, what can you pay? So he's playing the game, like anchoring really high. Yep. He has an uneducated customer, so yep. I was pissed off. Eventually, I left, and I, I bought the car from some other place. Mm -hmm. And now, ever since the, the birth of the internet, mm -hmm. uh, I don't buy cars traditionally anymore. I just you work with the, the fleet person through an online site. Mm -hmm. The price is exactly what it's supposed to yep, be. A broker. There's no haggling. Mm -hmm. I come in and this is literally how I bought my last car. Mm -hmm. I walked into the dealership. He said, we have this. It's not exactly what you want. It's got more than what you need. Mm -hmm. Here's the price. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, great. I looked at him like, I'm going to buy it. He's like, we're ready to do this. I just gave him my credit card. Yep. I bought the car on a credit card. That's it. We're done. I'm the easiest sell because I've already made my decision prior to walking in that door. I'm here to buy. Now, if more people work like this, mm -hmm. if more people did a good job of educating their customers about the cars or the products they make and sell, who they are, and are very fair and transparent with their pricing, mm -hmm. they can cut out a lot of the, <clears throat> cut out a lot of the time that's mm -hmm. wasted mm -hmm. in the, nego the negotiation, the manipulative price uh, pro process of getting people to buy something. Yep. Why yeah. do that? You know, how long ago was that when you had that first experience? I was 20 something. So that's, uh, over 20 years ago. Okay. Pre, pre 2000, pre like major internet stuff. Yeah. So, I mean like what's happened in the interim, right. Is the internet happened, right. And yeah. whenever technology touches any industry, it makes it incredibly efficient. Meaning the buyers and the sellers now have the same information. Yes. Right. So now there's no more, the dealer used to have all the information you had none. Now, oftentimes the consumer has more information than the dealers. But now the dealers are pricing their cars based on what like cars are selling like in the market real time. They, you know, they call yeah. market-based pricing. However, you see television, right? So everyone now is starting to shift towards customer experience, transparency, actually one price, a lot of one price dealerships, yeah. right? Yeah. And Carvana has helped move the ball forward. What's your perception of the advertising you're seeing for these dealerships? Is it still really old fashioned in your perception, like largely? Yes, largely. Uh, but you know, here's the thing. I don't watch commercials anymore. I haven't in, in years. Yep. It might've been 10 years now because even a guy who, who, whose job and livelihood came from making commercials mm -hmm. at a some point, I'm like, I'm not watching this. I'm skipping all of this. Yeah. You're, you're taking away my time right now yep. and you're interrupting things that I like. And I, I have a bad feeling about you right now. Mm -hmm. However, I do pour over on channels on YouTube who talk about cars and car enthusiasts who mod things and race cars. Yep. And I also spend time on cars the websites uh, of auto manufacturers that I really like. Mm -hmm. And of course, when I'm ready, they say, here's some dealerships near you. Would you like to, them to contact you? Yep. And so I'm, this era of pushing stuff at me, it's not working anymore mm -hmm. and it hasn't worked in a long time. And now mm -hmm. it's the era of pooling. Like I want to take these things. I'm leaning in instead of leaning back. Can you think of one dealership in your area? One dealership name? No. Not even one. Uh, if I thought about it really hard, I can probably figure it out. I don't pay attention to it, to be honest. Very interesting. Now, if a dealership made something very creative that happened to be YouTube pre-roll, you'd probably take notice. If it was really good, yeah. Yeah. It'd have it, to be funny. It'd have to be funny. It would have to, you would have to be like, that was good content, right? Yeah. Oh, they're a dealership, right? That's what it would take for you. I just, I love the objective, objective opinion because you're untainted by being in the industry. <laughs> so it's mm -hmm. very valuable. Um, I want to talk about one more thing, uh, kind of the, to kind of bring us to a close. Actually, I'm going to make sure that this is now that my team is not here. So, so we talked about branding, talked about the intersection of branding, marketing, talked about the kind of modern consumer culture and mindset. There's yeah. something going on now where the availability to create. And the future, your company, is really based on this thesis that now I want to make the ability to create broader, 
and have people do it vocationally, right? So they can create. The undercurrent to all that, I believe, is now things like Instagram and TikTok and Snapchat and and like my my son is 13 and maybe a little bit because I have an agency, but he's been editing video for five years, um, you know, and now kids are my daughters. They, they make they make music videos on iMovie because I won't let them have TikTok. So they, they make it on iMovie. They figured it out. Um, there's a tsunami of creative just flooding into the I'll call it the market, but just into consumer life. And you have this this thought like, you know, people like Gary Vaynerchuk do say creative is the variable, but at the same time produce volumes of, you know, what we would consider like basically entry level or volume content. What is your thought? Like, does that dilute the the quality? Like, I won't even say quality. Does that dilute the intentional, the more intentional creative, like from a designer and an artist? Or does it give them more opportunity? How are you seeing those two worlds collide? Uh, because my my designers, my art directors, you know, you look at the basic stuff, and it's easy to feel maybe um maybe a little offended, maybe be a yeah. little dismissive of it, and saying look look at that. I mean, that just it's not justified, right? Like I can't even watch this, right? What what is your what is your thinking on all of that content coming in creatively? What's that doing to the industry? Okay, this is a it really is a juicy one. Yeah, yeah it you really just is. Open it up right now. Yes. So, I'm probably going to say things that are going to get me in trouble, but that's okay. So I want to be sensitive to my, my fellow friends who are creative people who have spent a, 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 a portion of their adult life learning the craft of making things really good. Mm-hmm. And there's a place for everybody in the world who can do this really, really well. Mm-hmm. But it's a very biased way of looking at the world to say we must judge things on the fidelity of its technical merits. Like, is it 4K? Is it HDR? Is it whatever the the highest possible rendering and uh, subsurface scattering and uh, ambient occlusion rendering that you can imagine. Okay. Is the green screen composite perfect? So we get stuck in that because we were trained to think like that, to, to think like craftspeople. But here's the problem is when we're into the, in the real world and we're solving real business and communication problems, we lose sight of that because the Holy grail was to make it perfect. Mm -hmm. And this translates into how we post and create content ourselves. I have creatives who work for me and their whole dilemma is, is this the best thing that I can make? Mm -hmm. And so what do they do? They miss the deadline. The messaging is off and they're not making progress and sales are being impacted because they can't get over this. Mm -hmm. They just can't get over releasing something that is not perfect or substandard to Mm -hmm. them. And Mm -hmm. they're, and this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. So because, because it's a judgment, they, they see it as a judgment of themselves. It is the judgment. Right? And, and there's this line that it bothers me. I don't know how much it bothers me, but it bothers me that people say, you're only as good as your last job. I think some well-intentioned design professor said this mm-hmm. some decades ago, mm-hmm. and it's been perpetuated in the design circles. And so what does it mean? It means you have to prove yourself every single time. Sure does mean that. And where else does this work in the world? Where else does this work in the world? So your father, you've been a good father. <laughs> That's a way to mess up children is what it is. <laughs> well, let's just think about this. You're a father, right? And mm-hmm. you're a good father. But you have one bad day and, and your 13-year-old son comes up to you. It's like, you're a bad father because mm-hmm. you're only as good as the last experience I've had with you. Right. But we wouldn't accept that. It's actually the opposite. It's like, no, you, we know of you as a really good father, yep. but you had a bad moment and that's not like you. We even have expressions like that. That you're not being yourself in this moment. Yeah. But creatives, on the other hand, live in some weird, bizarre, alternate dimension where everything that you do, the very last thing that you touch defines your entire existence and self-worth. Mm-hmm. That is a really dangerous place to live in from a mental health point of view. Of course. We got to get over that. So if we are just let go of this idea that we have to be perfect, that this represents the penultimate of your achievement and your design aesthetics. Mm -hmm. Because what that does is it robs you of trying new ideas. And this is how we get stuck. This is how we get creative block. Mm -hmm. It's because we're saying to ourselves, well, if I try this, I'm not guaranteeing it's going to be good. In fact, I don't know what I'm doing. It's very uncomfortable and might actually be bad. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do as a community and as a society, is to say, what is the body of work? And I don't mean just literally your portfolio, the body of work, the things that you've done to help your fellow person. Yeah. And say, like, 
given that context, the sum of all let's parts, just give this person some grace. Mm-hmm. You know what? Maybe that tweet wasn't perfectly phrased. Mm-hmm. They were rushing. Something happened here. Mm-hmm. It seems very incongruent with who they are. Mm-hmm. Let's not get into cancel culture because you've done one thing wrong in the eyes of the public. Who, who just could survive? People. Right. Who can survive? That's the world we live in today, though. It really is. And there are a lot of social unrest going on right now. And people uh, from from Me Too, from Black Lives Matter, from even just the, how, how we deal with COVID right now, mm-hmm. that people are reluctant to say something because of that exact mentality, mm-hmm. the mob mentality. Who can know, s- are, are we living in 2020 or in Rome, cir- you know, circa uh, the Caesars, in, in living in this kind of arena where it's off with their heads? I don't get that. If, well, it feels right? like it feels like off with their heads. And the difference between now and Rome is that we are all so much more exposed, willingly, right? We we share yeah. so much, but this level of scrutiny and judgment that comes up, like you said, judging you on a thing, you know, like you know, this is. I, I definitely don't want to get controversial um, because it's a sensitive social topics, you know. But there's, I've heard this argument about um, statues and monuments, yeah. and saying that a monument isn't meant to approve of everything that has been done, but is more let to memorialize a moment in time so that we can remember and tell the story. Now, granted, some are meant to honor, right? And and so there's there's a lot of nuance there, but it gets back to the point of judging, like judging on the progress that a person made or judging a moment in time, realizing like, oh, actually this was, I don't think any of us deserve to be judged by our, our worst moment. No one could stand. And, yeah. and I know, yeah. I know we're kind of getting social, we're getting social with the conversation, you know, and going back to the, to, to kind of steer us back to the creative side. Um, I do like when you say it's dangerous thinking, I think that's probably the most poignantly I've ever heard it put. Um, but I, I see it play out in the creatives and I've, I've struggled to find a distinction that would do it justice. And I've really, the best I've been able to do, and it's not perfect, but I say there are, there are content creators and there are artists and it's the artists that feel deeply like any good artist. I feel deeply like great musicians, right? They feel deeply. They're usually a mess, right? Um, but also visual creators, right? They're artists, the ones who are artists and they see their work as their art, as an expression of themselves. Then you overlay that into a commercial application where it has, has judgments, it has budgets, it has benchmarks. You know, you're trying to achieve a certain thing with it and you're trying to judge your art based on whether or not it achieves this certain thing. And it just becomes a real convoluted mess. Um, I don't know, Chris, what's the solution? You're the expert. Mm, The solution is separate these things. Art is something you do for you. Mm -hmm. Art is, is a pure expression, uncompromised vision of what it is that you feel in the world. And it's usually done at great sacrifice. If you think of the great artists uh, in, in history, I'm not talking about recently the, the super money millionaires now, but I'm talking about just in, historically speaking to look at the larger context. Mm-hmm. Most artists in society have suffered or are not the rich and powerful people in nope. the world. And then there's this thing called commerce. And now what we can say is the things that you do look like art mm-hmm. are artistic in its expression, but it's not art. Because when you agreed, I show up to do a job for a deadline to – fulfill or meet a goal, that's the bargain. To sit there and say, somebody is going to pay me for me to make art and be upset at them for getting in the way of making it worse, Mm -hmm. that is a very immature attitude in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you decide I need to pay rent and and buy my boyfriend, girlfriend something nice, and this person allows me to do that by paying me, Mm That's the bond. It's the deal. Mm-hmm. Imagine this. Let's talk cars for a second. You go to the dealership and you're like, I'm going to give you money for this car. That like, great. I'm going to take your money, but I don't actually, you don't get to drive this car. You get to drive this other car. Cause I think this is a better car for you. <laughs> right. And you know what? I know you think blue is the right color for you, but you know what? Green is all the rage this year and blue is really passe. It's yeah. not really on trend right now. And you don't need four seats. You just need two seats. Mm-hmm. You know what? I know you don't like manual transmission, but that's what you need. So they're imposing their set of standards, values, and aesthetics on you. Mm -hmm. Nobody would tolerate that. Never. So one thing that I try to get people to do is when you have a strong opinion about something, 
try to follow the symmetry of logic. Like if you took this exact same thing and you applied it across other businesses, other ways of interaction, does what you think still hold true? And if it doesn't, something is out of alignment. If you go and pay good money to a barber <laughs> or a hairstylist and they cut it any which way they want and they're like, you know what, you don't get to say, I get to make my art. And you said, like, not on my head. And yeah. Really, not with my money. Yeah. The, the only way that ever works in life is like a really famous tattoo artist. Yes. Right? When, when, but it, it's not, but aside from that, if it's not a really famous tattoo artist, I better love the tattoo. Right. And yeah. Right. Like you better make it to my specification because I'm paying you to make it that way. And like, I, I do think, you know, I think it's hard to, to split out completely. This is an art because there's a, maybe it's more like this is an artistic expression, but it's not my art. You know, like you're making art for money, but there's like there's like a hold back. Right. If I'm making a song. Right. We hear we hear musicians talk about this all the time. Like, you know, they want they want they want to tell me what to say. These record labels and these A&R people, but they can't put this in a box. Right. You know, I got to say what I want to say. Right. Right. And that's like, you know, we hear that. And now it's like kind of a cool thing to do. And probably the A&R people are like, yeah, write one of those because it's like, yeah, people like that. Right? It kind of goes in the cycle. But I think there's an element of like, hey, like if you want this song on the radio, right, it's got to be three minutes. Right. We can't have six minutes with guitar solos and, you know, crazy effects all the way through. It's got to follow a formula. And people some people are like, you know, um, the chain smokers. Right. They are very commercialized and they understand the business of music. And, you know, but then you get into other people who maybe like Nora Jones, who had a hit song and then said, you know what, I'm going to make what I want to make. And so she's no longer on the radio. Right. But if she begrudged the fact that she wasn't on the radio, then like she decided to do her art and not the art that fits in the commercial lane. So I, I feel like there's this middle ground. I don't think an artist can really ever separate it. Um, that, that's how I feel. Right. But here's the thing. So Nora Jones decided to do her art. And it's really interesting that you bring this up because it's like she has this one song. I've tried to listen to other songs that I just don't like them as much. <laughs> right. She still has a beautiful voice. Yeah. Right. But the musicality is all different. I understand. Like, I just it's not that ear warm mm -hmm. and you just don't get it. Mm -hmm. So she's choosing on on purpose, very intentionally mm -hmm. to make her art. And it comes at great cost to her. Mm -hmm. She's not selling multi-platinum albums anymore. Right. And that's totally cool. That's the artist's prerogative. Mm -hmm. See, so when you do something and it, it has an impact on you, you get to call that art. Yep. But this is where I think it's disingenuous. It's not fair. Mm -hmm. When you take somebody else's money and say, no, I get to continue to do it my way. Yep. And you're right in that if you get yourself to this really high place mm -hmm. where you're sought after, where you have more work than anybody uh, can give you. It's like, I, I don't have time in the day. It's like, that's enough. Mm -hmm. You get to dictate the terms mm -hmm. and you get to be more selective with who you work. And over time it becomes, I make what I make you pay. Yep. That's it. Yeah. It's right? like when we tell our little and, kids, you get what you get and you don't get upset. <laughs> and that's it. And that's what you sign up for. But see, here's the thing. Usually this has a lot to do with art. So this person's art is valuable. Mm -hmm. So I don't even have to like it. Mm hmm. But if they don't make their art, it's not valuable. Mm -hmm. And so I give you money. Mm -hmm. You give me a thing. And the marketplace says that's your vision. So therefore, we're buying different things at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You're right. And I think it's a slippery slope. And this is why I, I delineate it very clearly. You want to do it. It comes at a cost to you. It's your prerogative. Mm -hmm. But when you accept money from somebody else to do a job, do a freaking job. Because in that middle, it's a slippery slope. And the so, people... The few, the few that get to the point you mentioned where their art is so well accepted that it, it's in high demand, the very few, it's like making it to the NFL, right? Yeah. From high school football. However, for the people who understand the difference um, and they can be immensely successful, can support a family, can drive a Mercedes, can do whatever in life or have their freedom or whatever in life that they value, right? The people that understand that and can emotionally stay healthy because they understand the delineation you're talking about. There's so much freedom in that, but it, but it definitely takes mental work and understanding. Yeah, so here's the thing. You and I were content creators, right? Mm -hmm. We're on a podcast right now and you're doing this piece of content. You're not getting paid as far as I know. Nope. 
to do somebody else's messaging. So you know what? If you want to take it into controversial territory, mm -hmm. then we go there. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, we don't. It's all up to you and you pay the price of your decisions and you're happy to do that, mm -hmm. right? You're okay with being great for some people and being not good for a lot of people. Yeah. That's your choice. Mm -hmm. But now if you work for me mm -hmm. and I paid you to make a podcast that was designed to get a certain kind of audience. Yep. There's an obligation now. You see, it changes again. Yes. Once you accept that money, yes. this is why a lot of artists say, I'm not taking money from the man because yep. I want to do it my way. Yep. I get that. No, that's it's the truth. Well, thanks for giving your, your perspective on it. I think it, it's it's a, obviously something you thought about, something you deal with, and honestly, it's something that you coach people through, like through your content um, and kind of through your trajectory in life. Chris, you've given us more than enough time. Um, I want to. I want to just thank you for sharing your insights with you. Always very thoughtful um, when, when you, you go into an issue. So thank you for that. Um, I want to end with the same thing. I end. What is the best way for people to connect with you? Mm. Well, thanks for having me on on the show, and it was uh, it was a pleasure having these conversations with you. You took me into areas where I don't normally talk about, so I appreciate you doing the homework and bringing me there. Uh, the best way for people to get in touch with me is to either go to our YouTube channel, which is The Future is Here. The Future is spelt without an E, so it's F-U-T-U-R. I remind people, just drop the ego. It's gone. The Future is Here. And you can also find me on most social platforms, including Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, at the Chris Doe, D-O. That's how I spell my last name. We'll make sure we link it all up in the comments or in the, the show notes so people can get there. You know, I said that was the last thing. I, I do want okay. to ask you one more question. If you could have sure. all the listeners or viewers walk away with one thing, what is it that you want them to remember from their time with you? Oh, geez. Okay. Oh my the, God. You dropped out on me. Uh, all right. Let me, let me make you, let me, I'll tee, I'll tee one up. Make that's a little, that's a little bit easier. Yeah. Okay. You have, you have a one-to-one, -one, one to one connection with somebody listening, watching right now. How do you just yeah. want to encourage them in these times? Okay. There's, Okay, this is perfect. If, if you're listening to this, I want you to think about this, that things happen outside of your control every single day of your life, whether it's your, your partner, your life partner, business partner, people who work for you, people who you work for, clients, things happen all the time. How you interpret what happens, the story that you tell yourself will largely determine the outcome of this. So this is really important. Since you can't change the input, if you want a different outcome, you have to just change your reaction. During this time, a lot of people are like, this sucks. 2020, go back. You know, this is the worst thing ever. But here's what it is, is that the tide is being pulled out. COVID is just accelerating a lot of the problems that we have as a society and in business. And it's accelerated to a breaking point. And that's what we're seeing. So the ones who can interpret this as not as a tragedy, as a woe is me, as I'm losing something, there's, there's a lot to be lost here. And look at it like when the tide comes out, what do you see? Where are the opportunities? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can see there's a there's an underground cave that you uh, or a passage that you didn't see before, mm -hmm. or there there are things that are out there. And I believe this is a time of opportunity. But you have to be willing to look at it like that and saying there are problems that need to be solved. I can help people. Beautiful. That's you've thought about that. I think I can see. Either way, we'll we'll come back. Chris, thank you again for spending some time with us today. Thanks, Paul. Man, I can't think of an interview in recent in recent history of the podcast anyway, where I've been challenged to think so much throughout the interview and also after the interview and also have seen what has the things that I've learned from that also started to put some of that stuff into practice and use them as conversation starters within my own company. Um, so I hope that the same thing happens for you. I hope that just like everything I try to do with the podcast and with the content I put out, um, that it gives you maybe a little bit more clarity to understanding where you are on the timeline, where you are on the map, and now you can maybe understand the next few steps a little bit more clearly. In this time when we're all kind of getting started back up in business, life is opening up and we're seeing the little ebb and flow in coronavirus cases and all that, 
Clarity is definitely in short supply, so I hope you found a little bit of it here. Thank you so much for spending some time here. I'd, it'd mean the world if you got to this point in the podcast and you enjoy the content, if you'd share it with a friend, share it with creative you know. I guarantee you if there's a creative in your life, they will appreciate Chris's input if they already don't know who he is. So I will see you next week. Until then, pursue clarity, take care of one another, and understand that like at any given point in the day, you might be standing next to somebody that is just this far from falling apart. So let's be a little kinder. Let's be a little gentler. Let's little, be a little more loving and accepting and empathetic and care for one another. Until then, I will see you next week. Yeah.